<laughs> well, welcome everyone, and um, I hope I can provide you some really useful information in this webinar. I'm certainly not, not going to tell you what laminitis is because I'm sure you all know um, that. But what I am hoping to show you is how some of the um, how a lot of it can be prevented. Up to 50% of laminitis can be prevented with uh, culture and feed management. So. There's not, uh, most of the information that I've gathered has been gathered from many publications. So it's really hard to get one source of information. So I've put some tables in here, which um, I hope will be really useful for you when you're, um, if, uh, if clients ask you about feeds and what feed to use, that the information in these tables will be really useful. So I think welcome and let's go. All right, I'll open up the screen. Okay, so we're just, just the... today at um, some of the really practical uh, information on feeding horses. And one of the things I had to go and see some little minis the other day, and there was 55 of them, and they weighed sort of from 80 to 120 kilos. And they were in really good body condition, good as in ideal, but a couple of them had clinical laminitis and x ray changes. Um, and I wasn't till I felt their neck under all that woolly fluff and that little mane that you could tell the neck cresty neck score was at least three. So I'll talk a little bit about that and its relationship to insulin resistance. Anyway, I know everybody's tight for time, so let's get started. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so my name is Christy, I work with Jen, I've worked with her for five years now and just to give you a little quick rundown, I can see a few names of people that I have met in the past but for those who don't know Jen's background, after doing her studies and spending some time overseas, she owned a practice for some time and during that time and working with other companies, making feeds and uh, doing research projects, the, the passion and knowledge came for nutrition and um, combining those is how we came to be the genquine that we are today. So I'll just do a quick rundown um, on some recent shifts in the paradigm or our understanding of laminitis. And I'll just say um, that we're going to stop for any questions throughout the slide presentation. Um, and if anyone wants um, the so publications on peer-reviewed journals supporting any of this or more information, just please let us know. So this was from an article written by Cathy McGowan. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of Cathy and her broad range of work. She did a PhD with Ruben and this just after I did mine and has since gone on to be a very, very reliable first, um, source of information in many areas of equine medicine. So, um, it's now considered a clinical syndrome rather than a disease itself uh, and it's believed to be the predominant form of horses presenting primarily for lameness. Um, laminitis is associated with the endocrinology. Um, and there's also recent research that's shown that the subclinical phase, which can last um, for three or four days, is associated with great cha gross changes in the hoof capsule and stretching and the elongation of the lamella cells. And that sort of goes one step beyond our understanding that it was a basement membrane problem. Thanks, Yvette. Um, now, I mentioned before the Cresty neck score, and there's certainly uh, relationships been demonstrated between uh, the, crest, the, the um, Cresty neck and insulin oh, resistance. Oh. Um, they've also found that as the insulin resistance resolves, the Cresty neck score will go down. And there's other various equations, uh, which I can certainly provide you with, which measure the um, neck, neck, Cresty neck score, and it's then um, put in an equation as a percent of the um, umbilical girth. So I can certainly provide anyone with those that literature if you if you need it. Now, so I said we were, we're having a really practical um, information provided here. 
So we all, you know, it's well known that the NSC of the diet should be less than 12%. So I put some feeds up here so that you can see what the sugar starch, NSC, ESC and WSC are now. NSC is the non-structural carbohydrates, which are carbohydrates that aren't involved in the cell walls. Um, and the ESC and the WSC is water-soluble and ether-soluble carbohydrates. Now, the reason there's some blank places there is because not all the information has been published for every plant. But if you go through the list you, and, and keep that on hand, you'll get an idea of what's safe and what's not. So also soaking is, uh, you're probably aware of soaking, and I can give you some information on that as well, but it certainly does reduce the uh, NSC levels. It unfortunately also takes out a lot of the minerals. Now, looking at other feed stuff, so the first slide was roughage. Now, this slide shows the starch, sugar, NSC uh, and ESC where the figures are published for um, various other hard feeds. And if you just skip straight to the NSC column, that's the one, as the rule of thumb, it should be less than 12% in the total diet. So you can see barley, which is not surprising. Um, corn, again, the grains are high. Uh, the linseed meal is, is good. Molasses is obviously high. Oats, sorghum, soy meal's low at 16 because it will be diluted hopefully with the other parts of the diet. The really important one is if you look at the wheat bran. Now, a lot of uh, pelleted and extruded feeds are based on grain byproducts like bran, pollard, mill run, hominy meal, um, mill mix. They've got a range of names for them. And the manufacturer may claim that it's, uh, you know, cool or low GI because it doesn't contain grains. But if it contains any um, grain byproducts in the formulation, it's going to be high in NSC. Now, this information has been published in a peer review equine science symposium. Uh, the first one, the our awful feed product, is, is laboratory measured by Symbio Labs, but the other ones have published figures. So, the cool stance again, if you look at the NSC, that's not too bad. Omega weight gain is 16, that's starting to rise. If you go down that list, even though the bag may say cool feed, doesn't mean that it's low in NSC. Um, and that, that's a really important table. I'm not sure some manufacturers are now publishing the NSC sugar and starch levels on the bag. Um, and as I said, these results have been published. So if they're not on the bag and you, your um, clients are looking at using something, make sure they ring the manufacturer because um, you can see this, um, like the extra cool mitovite feed is 33% NSC. So I'm not sure what the extra cool is, but uh, those figures um, are really important for people looking at feeds. And as I said, a lot of them um, require regulatory requirements now are that the bag does contain the amount of sugar starch and NSC on the bag. So that's an important one to get them to check. And if it's not, it might be on the company website or they can always give the manufacturer a call. Now, as horses with insulin resistance um, shouldn't receive anything any grain or grain byproducts um, because it will throw the glucose and insulin um, out of whack. Of course, that can precipitate an episode of laminitis. So when we look at some of the grain processing things, which are just advances on the old methods of grinding and boiling and things, it's actually really useful for horses that have to have a high grain intake because of their energy requirements. And it's very useful at not um, having starches and sugars dumping into the cecum, the small intestine has a limited ability to absorb them. Um, and so a lot of these cooking processes like extrusion, micronising, steam flaking, they do have a really big effect on improving digestibility in the small intestine. And that's wonderful if you're trying to avoid cecal acidosis. But if you've got a horse that's um, insulin resistant, um, then 
that these processes actually increase the glycemic index and so they're quite you know that you should use them with caution anything that's been um, heat treated to improve digestive in the small intestine will have, will be more dangerous for horses with laminitis or insulin resistance and the work that's been done on that so the processing of the grains influences the side of digestion and what we're looking for there in horses that are on you know more than two kilos of grain a day is to improve digestion in the small intestine because uh, the capacity for starch digestion is easily overloaded and as we all know that results in um, undigested or semi-digested starches and proteins arriving into the cecum which we all know buggers up the biome and the, B and the pH. So micronizing extrusion and flaking are great for horses with a really high grain intake over two kilos a day but they, uh, we need to be cautious and I guess the reason a lot more of the slides which are coming next, I'm really just showing you things that have affected um, starch and sugar levels in pasture because often we don't know why horses get laminitis or it was fine, you know, a week ago or yesterday and all of a sudden nothing's changed but it has developed clinical signs. Thanks, Lydia. But the work on the processing showed that heat processed grains were on average, 446% more enzymatically digested in the small intestine than unprocessed grains. Um, also, when those processed grains reach the cecum, they they can produce up to 221% more lactic acid. Um, and they the current methods of processing, like micronizing, extrusion, um, steam flaking. They do increase digestibility on average um, more than just the old methods of rolling, steam rolling, cracking. Uh, the only one would be ground corn. When corn's ground, it is 92% um, more digestible. Um, so let's have a look at what is generally safe. Beet pulp, the NSC ranges from 7 to 7 some of them do have some sugar in them and certainly you want unmolassed beet pulp um, but even the unmolassed beet pulp can have a high level of sugar so it can be soaked and again you can soak it two times to um, remove the sugar level and from an energy point of view half a kilo of beet pulp is equivalent to around a kilo of hay so if hay is in short supply but beet pulp's available um, they can replace it at that ratio. The other things that are reasonably um, okay in NSC are co copra, coconut meal, grand flax and, and soy meal. The dried distillers grains um, and rice bran can also be suitable, but if uh, on the previous slide I showed that rice bran can be quite high in NSC, so that would be something you wouldn't want to feed too much of. Soy and lupin holes have a low glycemic index and they're really good um, but any product that I said with um, a wheat with a grain byproduct should be avoided or only used with great caution in insulin resistant horses. Uh, now this is the big one pastures so we all store well animals store excess energy as fat and plants store it um, in as fruit cans or as starch um, photosynthesis is, you know, the production of sugar and the word carbohydrate actually derives from means plant sugar. Um, the C3 glass grasses, which are um, listed there, they're cold climate or winter grasses, so they store the fructin in the stems. But there's some recent work coming out of Europe and uh, Cathy McGowan has uh, been involved in this where they're actually thinking the fructans aren't quite as bad as, as early work by Chris Pollitt showed. And again, if anyone wants those papers, I'm, I can provide them for you. Warm season grasses, the Kikuya, Cooch, um, annual rye, they all can store sugar in the starch as in the leaves. So C4 grasses tend to be higher in starch and sugar, and the cold climate ones tend to be higher in fructan and as I get said there's conflicting evidence coming out now about the significant in fructans. Um, so what that also means is that in the C3 grasses the stems contain the highest level of NSC whereas in the C4 grasses the warmer climate it's the leaves that are the primary site 
of NSC accumulation, and that's significant in terms of slashing pastures or letting cattle or sheep graze them and which part the horses have then have access to. This is just a quick um, rundown on NSC, which is non-structural carbohydrates. As I said, they're um, carbohydrates that aren't used for the plant's anatomy or cell walls and things. They're the plant's energy source. WSC is the water-soluble carbs, and that's just the sugar and the fructan, because starch isn't soluble in water. And the ethanol-soluble carbs are just basically sugar. Um, now, we might stop, because I think we've, we're almost a third of the way through the slides. I just wondered if anyone has any questions at the moment um, on what we've done so far, or you can save them all to the end if that suits you better. Nope. Everybody's still on mute, so let's go. <laughs> but if at any time you want to interrupt with a question, please feel free. Thanks, Yvette. All right, next. Cool. Okay, so again, as I said, there's so many cases where we don't know what's caused an episode of laminitis. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit of a rundown of some of the things that cause plants to have high level of sugars. So as we know, photosynthesis is the production of energy using sunlight um, and undertaken by the plant. So when, so that energy is used up when the plant grows. So if the plant's stressed by drought or um, nutrient deficiencies, then the sugar levels aren't used up, even though, and the plant might look a bit unhealthy or not growing well, but it actually can be really high in sugar because it's a supply and demand situation. Um, daytime, so photosynthesis produces sugar throughout the day and the levels rise but at night time those sugars are used for the plant to keep for it to keep alive and so the sugar levels are generally lowest from around 3 to 10 a.m because the plants had to use up those stored carbs to continue its metabolism when there's no sunlight when uh, photosynthesis is greater than growth the carbs are stored um, but if growth is decreased, as I said, by water and nutrient stress or cold weather, uh, photosynthesis will decrease. Um, and in that case, oh. sorry, sorry. And, in, and in that case, <laughs> an example there is the growth, if growth is greater than photosynthesis, e.g. low sunlight, the carb levels will be low and also shade limits photosynthesis. So 48 hours of shade in Phalaris will drop the carbohydrates from 126 to 62 grams per kilo. So on horses can are safer eating plants that are growing in grass that grows in the shade than or on shady days. Thanks a bit. Okay. Um, the fructans is the cold climate grasses and they're highest um, in cool weather and they're because their optimum range for so photosynthesis and growth is 5 to 32 degrees but the c4 grasses in warm conditions their starch and sugar and photosynthesis is cranked up from 15 to 40 degrees so the c3 glasses i've listed the species there that are generally regarded as C3, and they're the ones that store the fructan in the stem. So there's a bit, there's a saying that the horses shouldn't graze the grass if it's longer than a stubby bottle, and that's quite a good, you know, generally six to ten inches, um, or you know, in centimeters up to about twenty centimeters long. Once the grass C3 grasses get lower than that length, they shouldn't. They're they're increased risk for insulin resistant horses. Um, conversely, the warm season grasses, uh, Kikuya, Cooch, Panic, Caspalum, etc., they store the sugar in their leaves. And so rotational grazing is better on the C4 because um, the cattle will take off the top and then the horses uh, are safer grazing the lower levels of the plant. So that sort of pasture management does vary depending on the species that's grown, the predominant species. Thanks, Annette. 
Um, and again, we, you know, horses suddenly get laminitis. We don't know why. And there's a lot of things happening in the plant metabolism related to weather. So even though we might think we've not changed a bale of hay or we haven't given them an change their feeds quickly, cold temperatures and frost can increase the plant carbohydrates because photosynthesis is greater than growth, especially in cool, sunny weather. The sunlight affects um, the carbohydrate levels. Um, perennial ryegrass can double its carbs within three after three hours of sunlight. Um, warm temperatures, the sugars can range from 95 to 560 grams per kilo. And fructans can range from three to 439 um, grams per kilo. Um, even though those levels uh, exceed the amount that Pollitt and, and other researchers have given and induced laminitis, because this can this intake over several several hours, it's not the horse hasn't been stomach tubed. Um, it's not as dangerous as it looks, but it's a big risk factor. So. Generally, anything that increases the growth of the plant reduces the starch level because the plant's using up those sugars for growth. When the water solubles are low, um, water soluble carbs, horse cons horses consume around three to four kilos of carbs per day, and that compares to five to 10 kilos when the um, water soluble carbs are high. And as it, again, as I said, that those levels exceed what has been stomach tubed to induce laminitis, um, but, but for some reason, it, it, um, if they're taken in pasture over several hours, it, it's not as acute as doing it in a research setting. The weather, again, we're talking about why suddenly a horse or a pony in particular might suddenly show with laminitis. When the nighttime temperatures drop below five, the chance of the um, NSC being very high the next day is too great to gamble on allowing a horse with a history of laminitis to graze. And the reason is that um, the plant's growth slows overnight when it's cold, so it doesn't use as much of its stored carbohydrate as it does in warmer weather. Um, so you can wait for several warmer nights and good growing conditions before you allow those horses access to pasture. And I'm sure you all know that some of these insulin resistant ponies may never ever be allowed back on pasture and certainly <clears throat> they shouldn't be returned to pasture till their insulin levels are normal. When it's nearly freezing, both sugar and fructan levels will increase. Um, and again, looking at why there's variations in the clinical presentation of laminitis, is some research from New South Wales showed that in ryegrass, the sugar and fructans were highest in July, regardless of the stage of growth. So often we don't know what's precipitated the episode, but this is really, I'm giving you this information just to show you there are so many, many things that change the plant sugar levels. Um, so, the, so this is again what happens with the um, balance between photosynthesis and, and growth. Um, when the nights are cold, too cold, sugars can still be very high in the morning. The respiratory enzymes that the plant depends on don't function well below 5 degrees C. And when the sugar is not reduced by plant's respiration, it accumulates. Um, horses are at a higher risk when temperatures fluctuate in and out of that low range. So again, we might think, oh, nothing's changed for the horse or the owner says, well, we haven't done anything different, but there's a lot more happening. Um, Pangola grass, which is more up in the Queensland area, the plant sugar levels declined through the night by 78% when the weather's nights were warm and the plant could continue to respire. But it, when it goes into a little bit of a hibernation, when the weather drops, um, they only decline to 2%. So unfortunately, simple statements like avoid lush grass don't guarantee low carb levels um, and the carbs are higher during cool temperature stress when the plant's in the heading stage. So it, it makes it a bit of a complicated flow chart on when or when not ponies can go out to graze. But I think it's really important that we understand the things that will influence the sugar levels in plants. It's not just rapidly growing green grass. Thanks, you. 
Um, drought, dry brown stressed grasses can be dangerous high in sugar, and that's because uh, they're stressed, they're not growing, but they're still photosynthesizing. The colour of the grass doesn't affect the NSC content. Um, and if you look at different levels of NSC as a percent of the dry matter, Coxfoot, the NSC is 20.7, ryegrass 39.7, and tall fescue at 31.7. Um, and that will vary, though, depending on nighttime temperatures, the amount of sunlight, weather, um, water, nutrients, etc. So fast growing grasses are not always higher in starch because the grass that's growing fast is going to be lower in sugar because it's using those sugars up and not storing them. The other thing that can affect it is drought because drought stressed forage can get quite high in NSC. Um, because, and also the ratio of sugar, which is the um, plant's energy source, and starch, which is the way um, the sugar is stored in the plant, it's a bit like blood glucose versus muscle glycogen, depends on whether the drought came on suddenly or developed slowly. Some research on Ceteria showed that a long-term drought that came on gradually, the Ceteria's sh uh, sugar levels doubled to almost 50%. Studies on coxfoot and ryegrass subjected to 45 days of drought, the water-soluble um, carbs rose steadily to over 40%. So it, even drought's not a safe time for us, unfortunately, if we're looking after these horses. And the other thing is that weeds, a lot of broadleaf weeds um, can photosynthesize very efficiently, um, so they can be high in sugars. Um, and so horses actually prefer high NSC plants. They're a bit like us. They like sugar, salt and phosphorus, and they do prefer plants that are higher in NSC. So if the pasture has a lot of grass in it and the weeds are palatable and not toxic, they can also be a risk factor, especially if the horse is on um, trying, to, they're trying to lose weight and restricting their diet and they say, oh, the paddock's full of weeds, there's nothing much to eat. Well, it can be. Um, quite a high risk situation. So what to do? These are some of the options, allow access only to shady paddocks and as I said between 3am and 10am. Um, in Canberra the sugars of Phalaris at sunrise were 103 um, milligrams per gram and by mid-afternoon uh, they were 160. Um, if Phalaris, if they have studies done on Phalaris where there was a shady day and the sugar levels were 31% lower than when it was um, a sunny day. But that difference was made up within two to four hours of the sun coming out. Um, we need to restrict access on cold, sunny days. Obviously, the sun's promoting um, photosynthesis, but if it's cold, the plant's not um, growing very much and using the sugars. And also when they're heading and seeding, um, and stubble fields, uh, sorry, when the plants are heading and seeding, they're dangerous, so the whole best to put the horses in post that or onto stubble feeds. The grazing muzzles um, reduce herbage bite size and can be used to restrict intake, uh, but ponies increase their intake by increasing their bite size and they can consume up to 50% of their uh, daily energy requirements if they have access to pasture for as long as three hours. So the grazing muzzles can reduce that. And it also reduces the um, grazing to the tops of the leaves where the concentration of starch is lower for the C3 plants. You can restrict grazing. As I said, it can be challenging because some ponies will gobble up up to 3.3% of their body weight um, and their intake for minis should be 1 to 1.8 percent and certainly for most other mature adult horses it should be around 1.5 to 2. Um, so if you look at the dry matter in level of pastures a horse can easily eat 20 kilo, kilo, kilograms a day uh, if it's a good eater. Um, so restricting access again have a shady paddock early morning never on cold sunny days uh, and only allow access to pastures that have headed or after um, harvest. Thanks, Yvette. 
Other strategies are to decrease grazing time or completely ban pasture access under stress of cool temperatures, especially if the days are sunny. Um, as I said, overgrazing, the stems of the C3s <coughs> store the fructan, so that can be a problem and that's where your stubby bottle test can work. You can rotate the grazing, <coughs> the stubby bottle or the grazing height of 10 to 15 centimetres and then don't let, let them graze down low. Um, you can say they can people can save some of their pasture areas to um, graze in winter when it's dead and brown. Again, managing pastures for adequate growth because that growth stress will increase the sugar levels. Confining a fat horse and its companion to a small grass paddock is another strategy. Um, but again, there are ponies that should never go back on grass. And defining, you know, a fat horse, they will. Body condition scoring is not very useful at determining either weight loss um, and also if the horse is losing weight, horse is losing weight, um, it often doesn't make any difference to their um, body condition score. In fact, there's studies on that showing they can lose, you know, 10 to 60 kilos and there's been no gross change in, in body condition score, which is why we're bringing out a weight tape, which I hope to send to some of you very soon. Native grass is generally a lower in NSC, especially fructin. I've just listed here which species are the lowest. So if you've got people that are wanting to reseed or sod sow or somehow mix up their pasture, um, the species that it has, there's some um, plants information there on which ones are safest. Uh, again, the native grasses, um, if people are looking, if they're in a cold season, um, the C3 grasses will grow well, but they don't produce much fructan, and that's your weeping, your tussocks, wallaby, spear grass and wire grass. Um, C4 grasses in warmer areas, the kangaroo grass will have less starch, uh, so that's a pretty safe species for insulin-resistant horses and ponies. Now, recently there was, oh, not recently, in 2000 now, that's not so recent, there was a huge study done by the US Department of Ag, and they found that 12% of owner-reported laminitis was due to grain overload with 10% of colic or diarrhoea. The rest of it was due to diet, obesity, or unknown. So with proper grazing and feeding management, we may be able to prevent around about a half of laminitis cases. And that work's been repeated in um, UK and Europe, and, and there's actually lots and lots of studies on in this area in the last 10 years. The European studies showed that 90% of laminitis in horses presenting for lameness had endocrinopathies. Um, and I'm going to do uh, a webinar soon on the EMS. And interesting, all horses that have the PPID and lamella pathology had hyperinsulinemia, whereas horses with PPD, PPID but no lamella pathology, that's the elongation of the cells, they all had normal insulin levels. Sorry, marking, marking up. up. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so I've recently re um, released a feed that I'm really excited about. I released this one in New Zealand about 10 years ago and it's used by a lot of leading studs and uh, they use it on the pregnant mares, the creep feed, the weanlings, the yearlings, and when they bring the yearlings here to, for sale, they'll send it over with them. It's also used in a lot of racehorses and I made a similar one in Japan um, where there's everything from, you know, pregnant mares to stallions. There's 45 stallions and they've got racing horses and growing horses and it's used this feed is used on every horse and then you can add grains, oils or um, and of course roughage as required but this ensures that the amino acid requirements are met um, in the youngsters and the um, creep feed, a pregnant mare, race, horses racing and stallions, they all need the same nutrients so as you feed more of the awful feed 
which I have to pronounce slowly because a few people think it's called awful feet, but it's actually <laughs> called all four feet. Um, so the amount can be increased depending on the horse's requirements, but basically every horse requires the same nutrients. And as in a previous slide, so the awful feet's based on um, vegetable protein meals. So there are absolutely no grain pry products. There's no brown pollard, mill, uh, mill run, et cetera. And that's why the measured starch levels are low because it's based on vegetable protein meals and there's no grain byproducts. Thanks, Vivi. Okay, hang on. It's just my okay. Um, so all four feed uh, is a high concentrated low feed rate feed. Um, it can replace manufactured feeds, balances, pellets, um, amino acid, muscle builders, hoof supplements omega-3 oil, tying up supplements and probiotics. So basically we've worked out if anyone's paying for two or more of those things, which majority of people are, um, it will say all four feet will save them money because it covers all of that. Um, all you need to add is fibre and extra energy if needed. Um, so it's, you know, it's a very good feed for you know, every horse in any discipline in any ages. Yeah, I'm not sure if um, any of you got to the previous seminar, webinar we had on common findings in diet analysis, but most people uh, around the world, whether it's top level eventing, endurance, thoroughbred racing, pleasure horses have fed a couple of supplements a day, sometimes up to 10 supplements a day. And we see a lot of um, levels approaching chronic toxicity on the intake. So what I really am so happy about with this feed is that you don't need to use two, three, five, ten supplements except on veterinary advice. So we're eliminating um, the chance of the overlap when supplements, several supplements contain the same nutrients. So uh, it's called All for Feet and my passion is clinical nutrition. So it, it can be, uh, it's really safe um, and nutritional for horses suffering from a variety of equine clinical conditions. Um, but it's also good for any horse in which a low starch sugar feed is recommended, which is basically every horse. And you probably all know that from a veterinary perspective, there's only two sorts of ponies in the world, ponies that have founded and ponies that are going to founder. And, you know, the prevention of this horrible condition and plus, you know, even aged horses, you know, they're increased risk of a lot of these conditions. And because of the amino acid profile in the all four feet, you don't get such muscle wastage, which is um, an atrophy of the type two fibres. So we've, and but every horse needs those. And if you think about it, a pregnant mare needs the same nutrients as a horse in full training because they're both building muscle, red blood cells, bone. The mare's building it in the foal and the young racehorse is, is building it itself. So when you think about it, it, it can be really quite simple. Thanks, Yvette. We've skipped forward there, I think. Uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, yeah. it's mucking up. <laughs> Just to add there also that um, all of the Genkine products are made in a PVMA licensed and ISO accredited as well, equine clean rooms. So the qualities there, the um, the the I've lost my words, but the the ability for anything to be contaminated is null and void, and um, we're making sure that they they're all um, meeting standards. Yeah, so we, we run regular analyses um, on on the feeds with Symbio Labs. So we they are the analyses are all staying within our guidelines so far, which is very good. Thanks, Yvette. Okay. Um, Jen, Dr. Jen also offers veterinary clinical diet analysis. So um, these go these nut clinical nutrition goes beyond spreadsheets, mathematical calculations minimum recommended intakes and basic diet analysis. So Jen look, takes everything into account um, and there's a form that can be filled out before she you know, asks all the questions. Um, and 
then personally conducts a diet analysis and then has a 30 minute consult with the horse owner and also the veterinarian is included in all communications. So everyone's kept across what's going on with that particular horse and with the, with your with your customer. Um, yeah, and if there's also any concerns after the diet analysis then, um, or any other advice that's needed, then Jenny's also available to, to go through that and help guide um, the horse owner along their journey. Um, these are ordered on our website, so uh, um, our genquine.com slash store, and so it's an easy process. There's, um, you don't have to call to book it in or anything like that. It's just a process, and then Christy and Jen jump on board and make contact and follow it all up. Um, yeah, Jen also contributed. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go back to that? Yeah, I was just going to say I've had a couple of people actually inquire this week and um, they've gone on to the store and they were sort of a bit con bit confused and concerned. So they've also um, can just give me a call and have a discussion and see if, you know, what exactly their concerns and their needs are. And then we go from there and, and go into the gathering the data and handing it on to Jen so that we can we can go from there. So that we're always available for um, any of your clients that you may need to just football any kind of nutritional concerns our way because we know that you're very busy. So, um yeah, we're, we can always um, cater to their needs from start to finish. Um, Jen also contributes articles to a range of magazines, um, articles in the Equine Veterinary Association magazine, Hoofbeats, with that also get EVA approval, um, ProVet, Partners in Practice, Practice Issues, Equine News, Australian Quarter Horse magazine, Equestrian News magazine, as well as the Pony Club New Australia newsletter. Um, Jenny's also currently re rewriting and reviewing the certificate, the A certificate and the B certificate for Pony Club as well. So um, that'll be a big, um, you know, help for Pony Club and also be good to, you know, update all the information that they've got and with their Pony Club members. Um, also, all the articles are available on our website that can be shared through clinics, on social media, and in your own newsletters and things like that. So, and if there's also a topic of interest that you'd like Jen to look at, or we may also have that's not available on the website at the moment, um, let us know and we can get that sorted for you. Has anyone got any questions at this stage? Okay, unmute. Okay, Anna, I think you, you can unmute yourself if you can. Mm. Anna wants to ask a question, but I can't unmute her. If I can. No, I can't either. Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Anna. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, you can contact us anyway. Um, our next slide shows you all the numbers, so we can't hear you right now. But you can call us or email us, and we'll get we we'll, we can discuss anything your questions you've got. I think she oh, has unmuted herself. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Anna. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Can't hear her coming through. Uh, Sorry, Anna. Uh, there, was, there was one last thing that the slides are just being playing up a little bit. Oh, I can't. It won't go to the slide I want. Um, we have an ebook available that has our products in it, as well as um, scientific references backing our products. Um, that's available online or in a hard copy form that we can, that some of you may already have, and if you need more copies, we can send them to you, so let us know. Um, but that's a handy little book to have for your, hand to your clients or even for yourself if you like. It has the little, um, it has a little blog on laminitis as well in it. Cool. There is one more slide that's just, I can't get to show up for some reason. 
Sorry about that. Oh, it's just missing a slide. I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> Sorry. So the, the slide, what it's about is um, we've opened up a Ask Dr Jen form on our website as well. So it's we've got a, a section for vets as well as a section for horse owners. So if there's at any time you there's a question that you've got or a case that you'd like advice or help with from Jen, um, you go into our store, it'll say um, Ask Dr Jen for veterinarians, click on that, fill in the details and John will be, uh, Jen will be able to respond back to you via email or if you prefer a phone call, then Jen can give you a call. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to open up Jen's availability and um, her help and advice to horse owners and veterinarians. So um, yeah, if you've got any feedback or questions, just let us know. All right, so. Is anyone else that wants? Sorry, Anna, I don't know what's happened there, but um, if you've got a question, just give us an, send us an email at info at and um, we'll be able to answer that for you. So um, yeah, All right. Thank you for joining us, and we'll send a recording around when it's available when we've got it ready. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming, and um, I want to do something on feeding the MS horse PPID horses, and also. Um, our last seminar webinar for the year will be in November, um, and I think I thought we could look at.